I have 45 slides and uh, 80 minutes to, to go through it, so I'm trying to be quick and as simple as possible. So, you know, I think you probably heard about that Java SAI can do feature engineering instead like for you, but what exactly, what, what actually we mean by saying like it can do feature engineering? So that's, um, I mean, in these slides I'm going to show you, you know, a very basic what Java SAI is capable for. We're just going to scratch a surface, basically. It can do way much more than that, but it's, it's, it's a good starting point. So a short thought about myself. My name is Dmitry Larko. I'm, I work with H2AI. I like to participate in Kaga competitions, but they also forced me to work on Drive CI, so I have to, you know, spend some time on working on an actual product as well. So, uh, what is feature engineering? A lot of agreement across the industry, basically. A lot of people who, you know, like uh, Andrew Ayn, for example, Peter Domingos, they all agree that uh, feature engineering might be one of the key factors of success in building of success, uh, good and robust and uh, model with a high predicting, predicting power. So, but I like actually the last, the, the last uh, definition. So that's basically, you're trying to turn your own inputs into the, into the into the things that algorithms you're using is able to understand. You know, so as simple as that, basically. So the motivation slide, basically, you know, let's say we have a 2D example. We just have a, a, a points, and we're trying to predict the blue points, uh, you know, uh, distinguish basically blue points from the red ones. There's no way actually you can build a linear model to, you know, to split up these uh, uh, points into two different classes. So it's not possible. But if you just apply a simple transformation instead of Cartesian coordinates is going to use a polar coordinates, things become as extremely simple. You don't even have to do like uh, any, any model at all. You just can apply a simple if else rule to, to solve a problem. So it's kind of, I mean, let's say uh, Patrick just spent like the last 20 minutes explaining you how to build the interpre interpretable models. Uh, but I'm just trying to show you how to build a very complex and interpretable, uh, uninterpretable features. Uh, all right, so in a typical machine learning workflow, you have a, a data like stored in some database, basically, right? Unfortunately, by feature engineering, we don't mean actually, you still have to, comp you still have to uh, get this data for yourself. Feature engineering happens when you have a features already like uh, in a nice tabular format. So like this, for example. It's a very simple example. You have your target, you have some categorical features, you have some numericals. And basically, what you're going to do, you're just trying to represent these features shown in a, in a nice and clean form to build, you know, to help your model basically to approximate better and to into the better solution. Like, for example, for numerical features, usually, all, um, yeah, I think all machine learning algorithms expect you to provide numerical features. Some of them actually cannot work with the missing values. So that's one of the things you actually have to think about ahead of time, what you're going to do with the missing values. And basically, there's the two possible scenarios all the time. In some cases, your missing values actually can contain some, some information about the data point as well. So the fact that value is actually missing, that means something. In some cases, the missing values might be become just, you know, like just a random fact, basically. It doesn't store any additional information at all. Uh, so in, in, in different cases, you can actually apply different methods. But in general, there is a two standard approach. For tree-based methods, you just replace your missing values with some uh, value outside of a, of a numerical feature distribution. For linear neural nets, for example, you just split in the columns into two, and you impute the missing value with using mean, and you just introduce additional binary columns, which contains flag yes or no, was, the, was this value missing or not? Like this, for example. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's how I can do it. Same goes for categorical features. Well, obviously, one of the easiest way to do you just treat the missing value as a as a new category level. But let's say if you know ahead of time that uh, actually the fact that category is missing is doesn't contain any additional information, you can just use the most frequent category to replace your missing values. And that, in that particular example, the most frequent category is A, so you just apply missing values with A. Or with a new category level missing, it's up to, the, to, it's up to you. So, again, your categories 
it's still not a number. It's not a, like yeah, a right number. So you have to encode it somehow after you deal with some missing values if you if you have them. So one other thing you can do actually, you can uh, you can inter you can you can you can tune your categorical features into the numer into numerical features to to get like a a more fine grain information to the model. And there's a different scheme of how, how you can encode categorical features into the numerical space. One of the easiest one presented here. So basically you can just label your, uh, you can just map your categorical levels to the, uh, to the random integer numbers, you know, which means nothing. It's kind of dangerous path before, because it's, it's very simple, but it's dangerous. Because in that case, you introduce some order to your data, which actually your data does not contain. Of. Also, this method is good for tree-based models only. I mean, let's say if you're trying to apply this approach to the neural nets, that's going to be a disaster. The second one, which is called one-hot encoding, then you, just you just replace your categorical is a, with a, uh, a simple binary vector, yes or no. So like on this example, for example, if you, if you have a uh, three-level categories, category feature, you just uh, replace it with a uh, binary vector level length of three. Uh, the main disadvantages of, of this approach, your data becomes very sparse, especially if you have a category with a, a lot of uh, unique values. One of the advantages here, you can actually apply feature selection on top of that to find the best categories actually uh, and build a better model using this, uh, just a subset of the categories available. The third approach, you can replace your category with a Frequency. So basically, you calculate how, how, how often this feature presented on your data set. But that approach can actually have its own uh, pitfalls. Let's say if you have a category which has exactly the same frequency, the model won't be able to distinguish them one from another. Also, well, by building a model, we're trying to predict something. So why don't we just use actually uh, a mean re of a response as a, our, as, a, as a replacement of a category level. This is a very nice approach. Unfortunately, it can lead to leakage in the data because you basically you can show the model the actual response and, inst uh, and instead of actually learning something, you can just memorize. For example, in this example, the level C, you have just a two rows in your data set. Both of them are actually has a positive uh, outcome. In that case, the amount of examples for this category is not statistically significant, and just replacing will be a, a bad thing to do. So what you can do, you can actually introduce a smoothen average. So instead of you know, straightforwardly replacing the uh, level category level with its mean, you make an, uh, you make an weighted average, which contains of the two, two terms, basically. You, can you have to calculate the mean of the data set, and the, calculate of, uh, and the mean of uh, this, this particular category level. And using a specific function that depends on how, much, how many rows for this category level you have in a data set, you can uh, calculate the weighted average. This lambda function can be something like, a, like this, for example. And you basically have two parameters to control, the inflection point and the steepness. Steepness controls the, the angle, basically, of the function. And the K, which is inflection point, con controls like how many points you actually have to have. So your average will be basically equal to 0.5. The, the weight of, uh, of, 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 of your average will be equal to 0.5. That's an example how you can actually calculate it, this smoothing criteria. And in the second one, you see we have a k equal three, and c just we have a c in our in our case just have a two values, and the calculated mean outcome will be very close to the data set mean actually. So basically, the, we we show a model which is not very reliable and cannot be distinguished from the from the data set outcome, from the bias basically. The second approach, which kind of can be combined to the previous one, instead of replacing the, like, directly, you can do leave one out schema. That means, so for, for, e for each row in a data set, you calculate the mean response by removing this particular row from the data set and using the rest to calculate the, the, the mean, mean response. And that's exactly what 
uh, H2O3 category, categorical encoding doing right now? So basically, it's already available and, uh, and uh, implemented into the open source H2O3 core. So what else can be done for numerical features? Sometimes if your numerical feature is quite noisy, for example, sensor data tends to be quite noisy, you can quantize them. So basically you can assign uh, specific bins for your, categorical, for your numerical values. And you can just calculate quantiles, or you can uh, uh, calculate histogram, depending on what on, on your data. And basically that's one of the things how you can actually uh, deal with uh, a noise in your data. Then you have a, as soon as you have a uh, bin ID, you can, again, encode this bin ID using, I don't know, like a, a mean value of a bin, of a contents, content of a bin, or you can actually treat this bin ID as a categorical feature and apply all techniques apply, applicable for categorical features as well. Sometimes, especially for tree models, uh, dimensionality reduction techniques might be helpful. So let's say you have numerical features on your data set, you can apply SVD or PCA on top of them uh, to get like a, a a small representation of these particular features. Basically also, uh, tree-based models not very good with, uh, on, with uh, a notion of the distance. So actually you can calculate different clusters, uh, clusters and use a cluster ID or distance to the cluster, cluster centroids as a new features in your data set. Well, not to mention the fact, sometimes uh, the machine learning models make a strong assumption about the nature of your target variable, especially for regression problems. And sometimes applying different target transformations might be helpful as well. Like on one Kaggle competition, actually that was helpful, helpful a lot. In this example, you can see that uh, uh, applying log with a base of 10 to a target transformation was actually was very stable across different uh, XGBoost models. It's a green line on the plot. The rest plots actually, you know, can vary as a lot and that's not very reliable. Also, providing exact feature interaction might be helpful for model as well. I mean, obviously, ran random forest and uh, XGBoost, they, are, they both are great approximators and actually they can approximate any given mathematical functions pretty smoothly. But let's say if you know you have a sum of, like a, you, you, you actually feature have a sum or like a, a uh, power of two, for example. If you provide this feature directly, it will require less amount of trees for model to approximate a function as, as, as precise as you want. So let's say instead of building like a thousand trees, you can end up with a model which actually requires just a hundred trees, trees to build. Okay. So, uh, yeah, but how to identify these feature interactions? Obviously, if you have the main knowledge about your data, that's uh, the best way to do that. Unfortunately, sometimes you are new to the, domain, to the domain or you just don't have enough domain knowledge. In that case, you can just, uh, you can just, re I mean, investigate the machine learning model behavior. For example, like Patrick mentioned, you can actually build a tree to see which features actually to use, like, you know, one after another. That gives you some idea, ideas uh, and insights about which, which features might be beneficial to, to build an interaction for. How to model interactions? Well, obviously, if you have numerical features, the easiest way to do it is just like apply different mathematical operations or build the clusters. If you have a, a power of categorical features, well, you can just apply target encoding. You just, you can actually, you know, uh, combine these two levels uh, of feature together and, uh, and treat them as a, as, a, as a separate categorical feature. Also, sometimes calculating different statistics uh, for different categorical levels using all numerical features available might be beneficial as well. Let's say you have a category with uh, two levels, like a, a gender, female and male. You can calculate different statistics based on your numerical features available, like a standard deviation, mean, median, mean, max, whatever you want and that's going to be a, a new feature in, in your data set. So that's, that's it what I have for you. And one key thing to notice, that's, so basically what's, that happens inside driver's AI automatically. When you see like in driver's AI like how many features being tested, that's exactly that. Feature interactions, different feature representations, 
trying to traverse the XG Boost model to understand which, which uh, feature interaction might be helpful. Just a random search of the different features across the feature space, you know, like uh, because we're trying to uh, balance between exploitation and exploration phase, trying to find some novelty in the data or build a model which approximates faster. So that's it. Thank you. Um, I'll be moderating with this mic, and I have this mic for whoever wants to ask questions. So here's your chance uh, to ask a Kaggle Grandmaster any question you want. So anybody have a, a question? All right, I'm going to head down there. I like this. Stand, stand up, stand up. No, no, they'll take care of it. So I wanted to ask, uh, basically, what are your plans for time series uh, feature calculation in driverless AI? As when I, I was one of the testers for my company, and I mean, it kind of only works really for categorical classification currently. So for time series, for time series, what we do right now, I mean, I'm not sure it's a, I think it's official, right? So basically, we already, uh, we already create some uh, time series recipe in driver CI. So what driver CI is able to do right now, say you have a data set and you're trying to predict, predict the sales, you know, a monthly sales or daily sales, for example. Something you, you have like a quiet equidistance measurement for. And you have a chain of stores, you're trying to predict like, you know, a different, like, you know, uh, a sales to some specific uh, horizon, basically. So driver CI right now can automatically identify the time, time column here. for you, the grouping columns. Like let's say a store ID, for example, and if you provide a test set, for example, right, it can actually automatically identify the prediction horizon you need. Otherwise, of, otherwise of, of course, you have to identify it yourself. So basically, in this in this classical scenario, assuming you have equidistance data, we already can create a lot of features for you, and yeah. But let's say if you have something more than that, like a, for example, a very good example will be, a, you know. Uh, a market ticks. So information from market comes not on the, on the, on, 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 on the same, you know, the, the, the period between the ticks in, 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 in the market data. It's a different, it's always different. So it's not equidistance. So you have to make it equidistance before you can put into the driver CI. So, so far it's a, it's a ongoing, I would say it's an, it's still in a testing phase. Uh, we're able to get like in a, in a different Kaggle time competitions which actually requires time series. We're able to get to top 20% of the competitors. So there is a lot of play, uh, there is a plenty of, spa uh, of space to improve, for improvements. There is a two Kaggle grandmasters who works on that and they actually might be sharing any details during our panel basically. There is a um, Marios Michaladis who goes as a Casanova. He's a top three on Kaggle right now. And Matthias Muller. Who is a, I think who is a top five, like five, fifth, six. Yeah, so these guys, they both work, they work hard for the last uh, several months to implement a time series into driver CI. If it's a quick one. Yeah. Hi. Uh, um, my question is how did you went from becoming working in data warehouse and business intelligence into becoming a grandmaster? Really small tip. Like, uh, oh, from BI to Grandmaster. I just love it. And I sleep for five hours a day. So that's basically it, yeah. Yeah. Five hours a day for the course of one year and a half. Yeah. And I participate in a lot of Kaggle competitions. So that's, let's say, I want to be rec recognized, right? And the, the, the fastest way to recognize and to learn a lot is actually participating in the machine learning competitions. For example, on Kaggle.com or any other platform you know. So that's, that's it. I think a consistent answer right here, we've driven and talked about this. I think you, you think, he's, he obsesses about the problem, basically. He's always thinking about the problem, very creative ways of approaching the problem. And I think the other thing that I hear a lot is they, they read the forums a lot, and it's really a community that they kind of learn and try, just get really fast at trying many things. I'd say community just pushing you, you know? Like, yeah. if you see somebody performs better than you on the leaderboard, it's just like, just 
<laughs> you won't just do better than somebody, basically. Let's give Dimitri a hand, folks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we're going to.